Welcome to Impact. I'm Michael Green, senior producer for 2011. This special episode looks at Holocaust survival and preservation of testimony for future generations. Our first story is about my personal journey to understand Holocaust history through the eyes of my grandparents, Adele and Bernie Green. They survived one of the greatest atrocities in human history. Through the years, they only shared bits and pieces of their stories with family. That is, until now. Adele and Bernie Green have always made the most out of what life has given them. Since immigrating to the United States after World War II, they lived a relatively quiet life. Two children, a modest home in the Bronx, and just enough money to make ends meet. Their situation mirrored that of many Jewish immigrants at the time, but the path that Adele and Bernie followed to the shores of America was anything but ordinary. The man I told you, the, my friend, that they brought the, uh, the American to... Also, he survived together. Oh, but, survived together. Yeah, and here's another picture. That's me. And here is the lady that I worked for, Emma Kaiser. That's me. And that's my very good fr German friend that I worked in the office and also in her father's office, who was the mayor of the village. Adele and Bernie were both born and raised in Zamosh, Poland, a town of about 30,000 people and 7,000 Jews. Growing up, I was uh, a quiet but uh, happy and we were a little above the standard of living. I was uh, one before the youngest. We were eight children. It was a happy childhood, even so we were not wealthy, but very loving, loving parents, sisters, brothers, and of course extended family. Uh, I am the seventh child. We are a big family, yeah. Four brothers and four sisters. It's the main square and town hall of Zamosh. In fact, my aunt lived in one of those buildings. When I was visiting her, I used to stand on the balcony and just look and admire the beauty all around. Yeah, approximately lived uh, 3.2 to 3.5 million um, Jewish inhabitants in Poland. Um, a lot of them lived very assimilated in big towns, but there were also a lot of them uh, more orthodox, living in small towns and villages, sometimes uh, um, providing more than half of the uh, inhabitants of these smaller towns. Adele and Bernie grew up knowing of each other's families, but the Holocaust would intervene before the two could ever meet face to face. The war broke out in September 1st, 1939, and by November 8th, airplanes came and they bombed our part of the city and everything went down in flames and we remained without anything. What the, the Germans did, they made a ghetto when they came in and they called it an open ghetto. There was no fences, but we had to have a identification and they took us to work. You have a lot of uh, localities which were so-called open ghettos, so there were no walls, no fences, but people were not allowed to move uh, freely. Uh, and at a later stage in 1941, um, in most places then these ghettos were actually sealed. Uh, more people from the countryside were brought into these uh, uh, cities. Aside from three older siblings who escaped to the Soviet Union, Bernie and his entire family were forced to work in the open ghetto. In 1942, they decided to liquidate all the Jews. So they took the Jews to the gas chambers and they killed them all. And then uh, they lined us up to take us to the, to take to the gas chambers. My uh, little brother tried to escape so they, they shot him 
right to, to the back and the bullet came out in the front and he was all bleeding. He, he raised up his, his shirt, it was terrible bleeding. And while I was trying to, to help him, an assessment came and he shot him right in the head. Well, the, the Nazis' attempt to murder the Jews of Europe was um, a very... Um, it, was a, it was about the obfuscation of memory. So their, their intent was not only to murder the Jews, but to wipe out the, the memory of the fact that they even existed at all. Before the war broke out, Adele's parents and two oldest brothers had immigrated to the United States, hoping the rest of the family could later follow. But with Samosh under siege, Adele and her remaining siblings were forced to fend for themselves. I can imagine how difficult it was for my parents to part with the rest of the, the children. But they wanted to make a better life. So we decided to make our way east. And so we wound up in the Ukraine. And my brothers managed to support us. But this lasted a short time. Two years later, the same thing. The Germans attacked the Soviet Union and we wound up under the Germans again. The first thing they did, just like in 1939, they were bombing the Jewish sections. We went into hiding to, in a village with another family. And on the way back, to our town, the German SS was all over, and they right away took away my two brothers and from the other family also, the three men. We never saw them again. They killed them. I think a lot of it is brainwashing. A lot of, a lot of it is uh, instilling fear and uh, terror in uh, the minds of uh, whether it be the Nazis, the Germans, um, uh, the Ukrainians carried out massacres, the Poles carried out massacres, turning their neighbors in. Um, to me, it's, it's inexplicable. Meanwhile, Bernie found himself working as a carpenter in Majdanek, a concentration camp located along the outskirts of Lublin, Poland. In Majdanek came an assessment and picked out Jews that are still able to work. So they picked me out and sent me away to Auschwitz. In Auschwitz, they asked for carpenters, so they took me out to build parks. The uh, life expectancy, they, they say, was about 10 weeks, but being I was a, a bricklayer, I, uh, I survived a year and a half in Auschwitz. Estimations are that uh, during the course of um, the years of 1942 till 1944, more or less 1.1 uh, million uh, Jews were killed. Some people uh, uh, say uh, the number is bigger, uh, up to 1.5 million. Um, we talk about, uh, since there was the election, selection for forced labor, um, we estimate that uh, at least 200,000 Jews were able to survive because they were sent off from Auschwitz to subcamps where they had to perform labor and so uh, 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 some of them could survive the end of the, uh, till the end of the war. We came to Auschwitz, we didn't have names, we just went by number. And this is my number. When I first saw it, it was a shock because I was not in a camp and I didn't know about it. Yeah, but you get used to it and you just, it just becomes part of you. For every person that survived the Nazi regime, there has to be um, some element of luck, chance, miracle, fate, whatever one wants to call it, because the intent of the regime was to murder everyone without exception. As Bernie fought to survive on his own, Adele and her youngest sister Miriam were hiding from Nazi soldiers. 
who had been ordered to load Jews in their area onto trucks to be sent to mass graves. Uh, and people were screaming, yelling, shooting, all this. We had my, my sister. It seems they found my sister with a one-year-old baby. And we, uh, we heard her screaming, please save my baby. But no one did. We never saw my sister or, we, or her ch children again. After that day, Adele and her only remaining sister, Miriam, decided to separate in order to increase their chances of survival. And we just wanted to live. We just wanted to live because we knew that our parents wouldn't know what happened to the family. Somebody had to survive in order to tell them. Adele and Miriam parted ways in 1942. They spent the next three years separated and living under false identities. I stayed with a kind woman, also religious, going to church. And I stayed with her a few weeks. Then I saw she had a permit to cross the border to Romania. When I saw this little paper, I didn't have no documents at all, no paper. So I s swiped it. I took it. It was Lydia Gordetska. This was her name. Of course, the age was different and everything, you see. And this was good till 1947. By then, I was in the, in the United States already. <laughs> there was a temporary passport. This was really my lifesaver. Jews in hiding needed this kind of paperwork to uh, identify themselves if they would be uh, kind of uh, encountering uh, uh, control on the streets, uh, uh, a checkpoint or so. And uh, so um, many tried to get a hold of uh, kind of passports which would identify them as non-Jewish Poles. Uh, sometimes they would uh, try to get in contact with people who would forge these papers and others try to get hold by stealing them and so on. So I did, I did my best. And later it quieted down. And by July, who turns up? Miriam. As Adele was reuniting with Miriam, Bernie was being forced through new labor camps in Germany. They took me to Buchenwald. And from there they sent me to Berger. It was like a a small camp from Buchenwald. Soon after being transferred to Berga, Bernie found himself in the middle of the American liberation. I escaped, and I saw a village. And I came in there to the fence and climbed over. I was lucky that a ladder was going up to an attic, and I climbed up to the attic, and I was, and I was there, at the attic. The American army eventually pushed back the Germans and found Bernie hiding in the abandoned attic. I came down, and of course I was so happy, and I took around this American soldier, and I was, and I was so happy that the Americans are there. It was now 1945, and the Allied forces were in the process of freeing the Jews. Bernie had made his way to England, while Adele and her sister were assisting American GIs in Germany. But both were in search of a way to the United States. I gave an ad in the paper, and my aunt found out that I'm looking for her. And then, uh, a cousin of my mother made an affidavit and brought me over to this country. Right away we received telegrams and letters and wanted to send us packages. We did, by then we didn't need food. 
The only thing we wanted, please get us out of Germany. It was uh, quite common to um, emigrate to the United States, but it was very hard because um, the United States had, first of all, this quota system, but they also asked for uh, so-called affidavits from relatives or friends who would uh, make sure that uh, no one would be later a welfare burden. And so people were dependent on uh, acquaintances or relatives in the United States already. After receiving their affidavits, Adele and Bernie traveled across the Atlantic to New York. I remember it was on a Friday we arrived, and my parents and brothers and, and their friends came to greet us, to take us home. And when I walked into that house and I saw a tablecloth and, and with candlesticks, and then the Shabbat meal, which we didn't see in six years. And my parents, especially my mother, she was so... She could hardly control herself. And... It was, in one way, it was wonderful to be with, with some of the family. But at the same time, the pain of losing all the others, not having them here, was terrible. The consequences are very, very real. Psychological trauma and um, that, that goes with that. Um, the, the sense of dislocation, the loss of family, that the the sense of living in a, a in in a vacuum living with guilt, living with um, uncertainty and fear and anxiety. Um, and if anybody tells you that is not the case for Holocaust survivors, um, then they really do not understand what the reality of that experience was. Um, the suicide rate among survivors is disproportionately high. Alcoholism within Holocaust survivors is disproportionately high. Uh, why? Because the, 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 the mental torture that goes with this is extremely real. But a chance to ease the pain of the past came into Adele's life shortly after she began a job assisting other immigrants at the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. So somebody told me, oh, there's two, two girls that they came over to this country. They were also in Germany and they survived and they work in the Hayas. And I went to the Hayas and met Adele. And I took her out for lunch. And four weeks later, we were engaged. It was my birthday, I think, yeah, in July. Yeah. So he gave me a watch. And when I came to the office, one of the girls who was working next to me, I showed her the present. So she said to me, I hope you know the meaning of it. A boy doesn't give a watch just as a birthday present. <laughs> yeah. So I say, I do, I do. Adele and Bernie were married in 1948. Three years later, in April 1951, they had their first baby. It was a big joy for everyone. The first baby after the Holocaust was a new life. My children were the most important things in my life because I, uh, with all the family was killed. We used to do the normal things like other people. We got friends and we used to socialize and uh, we used to go out once for a while for dinner and Adele used to take very good care of me. I tell you, every day at two o'clock we have a coffee with a very small piece of something. <laughs> yeah, this is our happy hour, I call it. <laughs> the two also like to keep family close. 
even when they are far away. Pictures mean a lot to me because during the Holocaust, we left everything. We didn't even have a picture of, of anyone until we came to this country. Like every story, uh, what it means to have survived is also very individual. Um, one thing I do get a sense of, though, is that um, Holocaust survivors know that they represent the family and community that they came from that did not survive, and that their story and their life in some way or other represent everybody that was lost. Adele and Bernie have found it increasingly difficult to go outside of their apartment. Over the years, Bernie has suffered through a number of ailments, several of which he attributes to his Holocaust experience. I wound up very nervous, and I was always depressed, and uh, I had a bad stomach and a bad ear. But Bernie still looks back fondly on the times he and Adele were able to go out and enjoy the neighborhood where they began a new life more than 60 years ago. What I do when it's nice, I go out for a walk and there are benches and trees there. I go little by little, I walk with a cane to those benches and I rest up and then I walk as much as I can again, I sit the rest and so on until we go home for supper. I tell you, being together for so many years, you know about one another so much. You, you grow together. And this is what I call love. Personal stories that give us insight into our past can get lost over time. Our next story takes us to the Shoah Foundation at USC, where some 52,000 personal stories from Holocaust survivors are being conserved for future generations. We're working with somebody's life story, and most of these people are not around anymore. And it's, so it's, it really is our job to make sure these testimonies are around for future generations. There was a promise made that this archive will be um, preserved in perpetuity, and access to it will be provided in perpetuity. The testimonies in our archive capture more than 50,000 voices of people that went through some of the worst trauma that has been inflicted on other people in our history, I think. To understand the mission of the Shoah Foundation, it's important to consider where we started from. The foundation was started on the initiative of Steven Spielberg directly after he finished making the film Schindler's List. And we proceeded over the next six years or so to collect nearly 52,000 testimonies in 56 countries and in 32 languages around the world. We began a massive uh, digitization project. We have over 215,000 of these tapes. If we have a fully productive day, everything works perfectly, we can process 360 tapes a day. And by process, what that means is a tape is loaded up into a machine here, it's played back real time into this computer. During that process, we collect metadata on it. We're looking at each frame of video, we're looking at the, the color levels and the luminance. So we're collecting data on, on every frame and it's being put into uh, a document. So one of the great challenges we had with our original tapes that we recorded, which was into a technology called Beta SP, the maximum life before you start seeing degradation is about 20 years. We started collecting our earliest testimonies in 1994, and so we realized several years ago that by 2014, we're gonna start seeing degradation to these original master recordings of these interviews that we conducted. And so this format will really serve as a master for us into the future, so that whatever new formats we need to create, if the internet goes in a different direction or we create a technology that needs a different format, we will have the, the sort of already digital master. Right here is, a, is approximately, I would guess, about 10,000 tapes. In about a week or so, we're going to receive a new truck, the next batch of 15,000 tapes. If you think about it, we're going to swap 
30,000 tapes. These tapes are scanned to Iron Mountain Boyers. They're stored pretty much in a hole in a mountain. You literally can drive into the mountain and it's, a, it's an underground uh, vault. This is a robotic arm in a scanner. Up here is a barcode scanner. It scans the tape so it can track it in the database. And it's, a, and it's got a gripper, and what it can do is it can grab tapes, slide up and down, and move tapes around to different areas of the robotic. I had an advisor once who encouraged me to think about testimony as a gift to us. And I thought, what kind of gift is this difficult to receive? And I think that the gift of testimony is showing us not only the cruelty of one person to another, but also the resilience and the ability of humankind, our, our innate ability to heal. That's it for this edition of Impact. Check out all of our episodes at uscimpact.org. Now take a look at some of our upcoming stories. It could be, so I see a woman as a muhajaba, I cringe. That's Islamophobia. Or you're driving along, you see a mosque, you cringe. That's Islamophobia. Or you hear that a mosque is going to be built. Oh my God, how, you know, how, how can we be safe with these people around? That's Islamophobia. People ask me all the time about God. In Judaism, God is called the Ein Sof, the Infinite One and I'm finite. So um, you want to call it God, you want to call it higher consciousness, whatever you want to call it. There has to be something higher than myself, otherwise my recovery is going to be based just in me.